feel like we should have a boxing ring yeah, rather right than <laughs> a couple of chairs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, let's just kind of start off with a broad overview of this year. We've had a lot of crypto downturn, prices are down, Terra Luna, 3AC, Celsius. I mean, just starting off, Ben, I'm curious, you know, you've been walking around this conference for the last couple of days. Is the crypto hype still there or has it fizzled? Well, I think crypto is looking for a new story to tell. Um, a lot of the stories that it has been telling haven't come to fruition. Um, you know, uh, it's these currencies are not really currencies economically. You know, my, my degree is in economics. Um, they're not a, a medium of exchange, a unit of account or store of value. So they're rather investments of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others. So they're securities. Um, they're unregistered and licensed securities that are being sold to the general public. So, you know, we've experienced this about 100 years ago uh, prior to having securities laws. And, and now we're sort of reliving it 100 years later. So I think that, you know, the, the air has come out of the bubble thus far, uh, a lot of it, right? Two trillion sort of vanished in about six months. Um, but w where we go next, I think, is not, is, hasn't been determined yet. You know, I think there's a lot of sort of um, dust to settle. Charles, you were scoffing. You want to rebuttal? Uh, it's absolutely bizarre to call a protocol where the founders could disappear like Satoshi uh, and say it's a security. I mean, what policy consideration is achieved with this? And you can create currencies with these things. That's what El Salvador is attempting to do. You can construct something that is a means of exchange and has stable value. It's a derivative of basically a digital commodity. Now, you can certainly make anything you want a security. You can make oil a security if you want to. So I, I tend to take a more nuanced view of this industry, and I think we've achieved great things. We've gone from nobody to 300 million people worldwide, according to Broadridge, who are cryptocurrency users who, who have done something with a cryptocurrency. Thousands of companies have been formed, publicly traded companies have been formed that are listed on exchanges like uh, Coinbase, for example. And we've inspired an entire generation of people to reimagine how money works, to reimagine how finance works. Because let's be honest here, the financial industry fucks people. Three billion people are underbanked or unbanked. Billions of people don't have economic identity. There's inequality everywhere you look. It's hard to get a loan. In Africa, 85% interest rates for microfinance. These are the problems the legacy industry gave us. We didn't just wake up one day and said, let's replace a perfectly good system. Crypto was born from 2008. And they promised us they were going to fix everything. And the solution was to make too big to fail bigger. So we created a whole industry to reimagine how money works, identity works, and all these things. And to, to say it's just a security, uh, is a bizarre, bizarre notion, and it's not productive at all. I'm, I mean, I think the jury's still out on some of the actual classifications of these crypto assets. I, I mean, there's... I, I, I'd love to just, just re re yeah, about that just I for a second. I, I don't know, Charles, have you had the opportunity to go to El Salvador? I, I actually met President Bukele oh, in person. Yeah, yeah, so I went to San Salvador. Yeah, so, so I did too, and as you know, you know, people really aren't using it as a currency there. Less because than it's 2%. a digital commodity, and you can use it to make a currency. Okay. Okay. And it's a bi-monetary system. We have them everywhere. Argentina does it. They have the right. dollar as a store of value, and then they use the peso to spend. It's perfectly reasonable to do that. Well, you know, I, I have to say that the, the, the fact that it's not being used in the one country that's trying to use it as a currency, to me, speaks volumes. Did America use its gold reserves as a transactional currency under Bretton Woods? I, I really don't think that's a fair, you know, comparison. It's digital gold. That's what they're using it for. <laughs> Except that's it's also lost half its value since Bukele yeah. sure. introduced it as a store of value. And he introduced it as a currency, but it's not being used as one and it doesn't work well as one. It's because it's a, a digital goal. It's a reserve the country's adopting. They're still dollarized, and they're still basically under U.S. jurisdiction. Guys, it, it's 13 years in. We just got started. And what makes this space magical is everybody is trying to do new things. And lots of it fails. VC, 90% of the time, stuff fails. You talk about markets going down. Stock market's down $9 trillion this year. 
Inflation is at 8.5%. The U.S. debt is over $30 trillion. This is the system we have today. And they say, don't worry about it. We'll make it better. Just trust us. Everything will be great. I remember when I went to college, it was $4.5 trillion in the national debt. Now it's 30. When does it stop? And when so, does the monetary collapse happen? So I want to pivot slightly. Um, we've also had a lot of crypto hacks that have happened this year. Yeah. And you can argue that that's a byproduct of innovation within the industry. But M Molly, I want to turn to you because this is something you track very closely. Is the hacks that are the hacks that we've seen this year, um, in the last couple of years, but especially this year, do you think that that is actually posing a barrier to broader crypto adoption? Or is that just a growing pain? No, it's absolutely a barrier. I mean, there have been some enormous hacks in the crypto industry. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars repeatedly uh, to the point that it doesn't surprise me anymore. I'm like, oh, only 100 million? You know, it, it's incredible. And the fact that normal people are being told to put their money into these projects and then basically have to rely on the goodwill of the projects to maybe compensate them if there's a hack, if they're able, um, but they have no you know, uh, requirement to do so, it's unreasonable. I mean, there are no real consumer protections and the security practices are unconscionable, honestly. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I don't understand how a, an industry like this can say, you know, I, I, I meet crypto founders and people who are in the crypto industry and widely people in the industry will say things like, well, yeah, 80% of it's a scam, 90% of it's a scam, but you know, there's real stuff in there. And how can an industry accept that as okay and normal and healthy? And how can an industry encourage average people who don't have money they can stand to lose to, to become involved in something like this without you know, any sort of protection? I mean, Charles, do you think that the hacks are a barrier to crypto's broader acceptance? I, I've been a harsh critic of the software standards in the industry. The reason we created Cardano, in part, was to put evidence behind protocol design. We've written 150 plus peer-reviewed papers out of institutions like University of Edinburgh, Stanford, and other places. And we've been running for 1,200 plus days, 24-7 uptime, not a single hack. Uh, so you can write software well, but you have to use techniques like formal methods for it. And unfortunately, the incentives in the industry are aligned right now to write software poorly and get it quickly to market. This is not a new phenomena that's unique to cryptocurrency. We see it all the time in Silicon Valley. We see even Boeing doing it. It was a 737 MAX, and a lot of people died because of that. So whenever you have a misalignment of incentives, that's a problem. And that's when the regulator comes in. To say it's the Wild West is being disingenuous. This is not 2012. This is 2022. We have Mika here in Europe. Next year, a very strong possibility U.S. government's going to pass laws, and regulators have already begun trying to create frameworks. For example, the CFTC went after a certain DAO and said it's an un, uh, unregistered association or unincorporated association, and there's been numerous regulatory crackdowns that have occurred, and fraud is fraud. Um, l software liability standards are difficult, and that's not our issue. That's an issue we inherited as it a society. It is your issue. Hang on. <laughs> it's an issue we've inherited as a society from companies like Microsoft. There have been tons of hacks in the 1990s and 2000s, and ever since there was an internet on software, and the software companies don't want liability. Bruce Schneier was writing essays about this in the early 2000s saying software developers need to be held liable for the software that they write. We say, hey, it's free speech, it's open source code, and U.S. law enables that. This is not crypto specific. The crypto issue is that there's money behind that. Yes. Okay? And yes. so I do agree <laughs> that there needs to be some standards here. And let's look at the average retail crypto holder. The vast majority of them leave their crypto on exchanges and the vast majority of them are fairly diversified at this point. Yes, people have lost huge sums of money, most myself people have included. Lost, most people have lost money, though. Uh, this year alone, I lost $2 billion. I'm right, uh, there, I'm right there No, with but, you. But, but, but most people <laughs> who have invested in cryptocurrency have lost money. Okay, and the thing is that most people who invested in dot-com startups lost money. You see, it, it, these boom-bust cycles happen. There's 
enthusiasm for markets. It could be 1849 with the gold rush. It could be the 1870s with the oil rush. It could be the tulip it could, mania. Could you, be the tulip mania. You can do all these things, and there's winners and losers, but you have to separate the technology from the micro day-to-day -day view and say, is there social utility to the work that we do? Yes. And I don't yes. know how to solve problems like, how do I move a medical record from Mozambique to America in a trustless way without using a blockchain to do something like that? I don't know how to create universal credentials so that your academic records in Addis Ababa can be honored in Oxford or other places without a blockchain. I don't know how we're going to do COP26 and rebuild all of the ESG stuff, uh, you know, all the supply chains of the world and every company in the world to be carbon neutral and environmentally friendly unless you have an audit layer. And what are we going to do? Just put China in charge of all of that? No, it needs to be decentralized and trustless because no one nation state can run it. And this is the whole world we're talking about. Your identity, your privacy, your voice. What constrains Elon Musk with Twitter? If it's a protocol, it would constrain him. Other than that, you just have to trust him. The same for Mark Zuckerberg with Meta. And that's the point of crypto, and that's what we're building. There's going to be tons of broken plates along the way, and nobody seemed to complain broken too much about Pets.com. Yeah, the broken plates are the people. The broken plates are the, the tens of millions of Americans alone who have lost money. Okay, and they weren't involved in that? They didn't consent to that? Somebody put a so gun to their, their head? No, what I'm saying is they made a decision. And the, pr the thing about crypto is it gives you freedom, personal the accountability. But, the with no but, but with no disclosure, sir. With but all what, due okay, respect, but, but, securities what? laws are predicated on disclosure. When you invest money, you need to know who the hell you're giving your money to and what the hell they're doing with it. Now, is our regulated financial system good? No, I agree with you. <laughs> but you're, you're shifting. Each time we ask you questions about the industry, you're shifting the blame to other places, right? It's yes. it's the, all of the problems with oh, the regulated tons of financial in this industry. We, but we agree. Oh, so good, so yeah. good. So let's address those because we are not here. We're not bankers, sir. We are <laughs> we are simply. You know, I'm a journalist. You're, you're you're. I don't even know how you classify yourself. But we're <laughs> we're <laughs> we're here just trying to have an honest conversation about you know the fact that. Um, so, a so lot wait, hang of people on. You have think lost security disclosures money. are somehow going to solve all the issues? I think no. it's important to realize that we agree that there are issues in the financial system, in the legal structure around the financial system. But pointing to something and saying, this is different, we should do this, is you can't assume that because something is different, it's better. It's possible for something to be different and also worse. And, you know, people are being taken for a ride in crypto. Um, you know, with the promise that this is going to be the new financial system and this is going to free people from the, you know, big banks that are ruining their lives. And so far, crypto is ruining people's lives. Okay, I want to stop there before, like, <laughs> what is actually John? Um, but I want to I wanna shift a little bit to some of the NFT craze, because that's been another component of the last year and a half, two years. Um, there's been, there's obviously been a lot of celebrity endorsements that are still continuing to happen of NFTs and a lot of issuance on that, on that landscape. Mm. I mean, why do you think that all of these celebrities and a bunch of very prominent people have interest in the crypto space? What is the motivation there? Money. The motivation is money, real money. Mm. Um, they got paid real money to, ha to hawk a product. They, they, they were pro... I, I can't speak to their motivations, you know, across the board, of course, uh, or, or, or how their familiarity with blockchain technology. But uh, my guess is that most celebrities got a call from their agent and they said, hey, you can get paid X dollars to do almost nothing. And the celebrity said, tell me more. You don't think there's an actual, I guess, creator um, fan base kind of application to that? It's. I mean, I think, you know... <sighs> I, I think that a lot of people are hoping there will be, and mm -hmm. maybe there will be, but right now I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's collapsed, and that was in 99%. There's just a, a heated debate whether the NFT market has collapsed 97% or 99%, <laughs> so I, I, I will leave that unanswered, but regardless, it's down uh, significantly. And, I, and I, economically, that, that looks like sort of the most speculative thing of a already speculative thing has fallen the fastest as the price of money has gone up. I mean, one of the things that's interesting that I actually agree with Charles on is that, 
you know, we have created this easy money system. That's the title of our book, so I am, I am shilling this book. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we have created easy money. And in those times historically where credit is sort of easily, you know, money is, is, is uh, readily available, people gamble with it, I mean, historically. And so I think that's what we're seeing. And NFTs, I think, are a good example of that. Um, we're getting toward the end of the time, but I want to just kind of quickly go around. Molly, if you had a blockchain that was to as much extent possible divorced from the speculation of cryptocurrencies, is there an application for the blockchain to actually change the way that things are built, money is moved? I guess, is there a positive aspect you see to it divorced of the speculation? Yeah, I get asked that kind of a lot. And it's an interesting question because it's kind of like asking, well, you know, if fossil fuels had no emissions, would, would you find you know, them useful and should we stick to using them? And it's like, well, maybe, you know, if, if pigs could fly, that'd be cool too. But, you know, when you can't actually take something away from its fundamental properties, it's sort of not a useful question, in my opinion. I think there are positive things about blockchain technology, interesting things about the technology, but you also really have to consider the full picture and the negatives of it, the industry and how it is uh, preying on people um, and the damage that it's really doing and, and sort of look at it from the full picture rather than saying, well, if we solve these problems, you know, this long list of problems that has no real promising solutions, then yeah, sure, it'd be great. You know, if we can solve all the unsolvable problems, then absolutely. So protocols or companies, those are your two options. The world either runs on those. And if you want to live in a world in the 21st century to continue what we started in the 20th century of having a small group of companies have total control over the way your money works, your identity works, uh, the way information flows, the media that you consume, we can do that. And they can live in nice regulated silos and have shares and you have no say. Okay, and that's where we're at, multi-trillion dollar companies like Microsoft and Facebook and others. Protocols are like TCP IP, it's how the web works. Yeah. And when you have a protocol, especially when you tokenize it, then that's a resource that you can use to regulate it, maintain it, and sustain it. That's the point of the tokenomics. The why is it so volatile? Because we're having difficulty finding a value, a price. And like the Gartner hype cycle, you tend to overvalue, then undervalue, then overvalue, and then eventually you find something. Amazon is a great example of that. In the beginning, 2000, they collapsed. A lot of people lost money there. And 20, it took them until 2011 to get back to the value they had in 2000. Well, was it a scam company? No, it's just people knew it was going to be a big deal, but they had a hard time pricing that. Now, with but you respect, cannot, well, hang on. I got to answer okay. the NFT oh, one. I want to. I want to let Molly get one last word in, okay. and then I unfortunately have to end it, so you guys can continue <laughs> fighting backstage. <laughs> I was just going to say that you can compare a collapsing industry to Amazon, which did return to being a fairly highly valued company. Or you can compare it to the many more companies that have collapsed and have not continued to succeed. It's like people saying, oh, well, it's the early internet. That's going based on the assumption that blockchain is equally as revolutionary as the internet, which is something that you have to really prove. You can't just say that about any technology. Well, we okay, have. Okay, okay. Right. We I have. have. I have to cut it off there or they're going to wind up <laughs> yelling at me. That was bad for me. Um, thank you guys so much for watching everyone's par. Thank you guys for taking each other they're on um, and it's been a pleasure being with you thank you, thank you everybody thank you <laughs> uh, thank you